Hi everyone, welcome uh, to this, our first interview of our series with uh, Dr. Jim White, who's joining us. It's fantastic to have you. Thank you for joining us. Could you, uh, for people who haven't seen you before, just give us a little bit of an introduction of yourself, who you are, where you are, and, and what you do with your sort of day-to-day? Yeah, um, I have my foot in kind of a couple of worlds, uh, both academia and the church, and um, I am a professor of theology and culture and a former seminary president, and I still serve as professor at various institutions here in the United States, where I reside in North Carolina, and I'm also a founding and senior pastor of a church, Mecklenburg Community Church, um, that uh, was started in the fall of 1992. And with just me and my wife and then three kids believing in church growth, we had a fourth. So uh, no core group, no splitting off of a church. We literally arrived with a U-Haul truck and started in a Hilton hotel ballroom. Right. Um, that was, like I said, fall of 92. Um, and um, we had 112 people at our first service. Through the strength of my preaching, I got it to 56 by the third week. <laughs> so cut that one in half. And then it, you know, we began to grow from there. And uh, it's been a very fun ride. We're now at around pushing 11 to 12,000 uh, active attenders that we know of. We can talk more about what's happened during COVID. That's been a little bit harder to read, but it's all been positive. Um, but all of our numbers. Uh, online stream stuff just jumped dramatically, but and our in-person events have uh, been rather uh, puzzling to us by how large they've been. But uh, that's what we were running before COVID, and about seventy percent of our growth has come from the unchurched. So we're very focused on on that. Wow. That's probably already more than anyone wanted to know. Um, <laughs> I like to write books, you know, and God's been gracious in letting me do that some. So. Um, Probably the most important thing is that I am married to my lovely wife, Susan, uh, and we're coming up on, um, uh, and are coming up on 40 years and I've got four kids and I've got 12 grandchildren. That's so impressive that, stats that's, by anyone's that's measure. <laughs> no, that's great. And thank you for giving your time to join us today. Um, so if you have stumbled across this interview and you aren't familiar with us here at Rising Brook, um, Martin, why don't you introduce yourself and say uh, perhaps who you are, what you do, but also how is it that we've come to have this interview today? How do you know Jim? Okay, um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm Martin, uh, senior leader here at Rising Brook, been here for just over 20 years in Stafford in the Midlands. And I know Jim because I've, I've met him at some conferences here in the UK that he was speaking at. He's often here. We got to know one another. He's been in this building a few times. And in the last few years, pre-COVID, we ended up, we meet when, if Jim is in the UK, we meet up in London and have a drink together and catch up, have a chat. So we become friends. He writes a brilliant blog called Church and Culture. Just need to look at it. It comes out every week and it's ever so helpful and apposite. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I can testify to that. I've been following um, I came to a session that you were doing here at, in the church building, and there are still things that I remember you saying that I, I think about and, and resonate with me. I think we talked about some evangelism stuff, and, and that's my heart. And there were things that you said that I still now say to other people. Um, I hope you don't mind me stealing your material, but it's, it's really helpful, some of the ways that you frame some of these things and reading your books and following your blog. It's, it's almost like there's, a, there's been a a Jim White voice that mm. speaks into uh, us here is uh, certainly some, some of the leadership stuff. So, yeah, it's really great that you can, you can be here again. We want to talk a little bit about what's going on at the moment in the world. Uh, one thing that's beautiful, even though you're North Carolina and we're here in, um, hopefully the weather's turned, but it was quite soggy this morning in the middle of the UK, is that we are all experiencing, um, for the first time, perhaps our generation, a thing which we can all relate to perhaps in a different way, but we're all going through the same storm, different boat, COVID. Um, what, if you could speak to maybe how the church in America um, and maybe your own context has, has been dealing with that and what the, you know, it, you can't extrapolate it from the politics that are happening in America and it's been quite, um, 
a bit of a hotbed um, of late, of lots of different issues. Um, but, but in terms of the COVID stuff, how the church has responded, how people have looked in, you said that your, your church has increased in, in unchurched people uh, through the online stuff. But So what's the perception of the church in America at the moment to do with the way that COVID has kind of run its course yeah. over the last year? I have to answer that from two perspectives. One, how would Christians looking at it and how are non-Christians looking at it? I think, and I've, I've, I've written about this, I think non-Christians looking at the church, it's a PR disaster. Um, and because we have appeared, particularly evangelical Christians, have appeared to be on the, on the wrong cultural side morally of almost every issue. Now, again, I'm not getting into who's right, who's wrong. I'm just give, telling you that the non-Christian perspective is that on racism, we were tone deaf and we're concerned much more about looting following George Floyd's death than George Floyd's death. Um, on issues related to uh, the vaccine, it was Christians wanting to insist on mass gatherings and super spread, which are just seen as super spreader events here, uh, anti-masking and, and, and all this stuff in the name of religious freedom. And I'm not gonna take that shot and because it's part of a vast conspiracy and I'm not gonna give up control of more of my life to whatever. And it's made uh, Christians seem just uh, very insensitive, very selfish, very belligerent and anything but loving our neighbor. And uh, so you, you know, I could just go down the list. I mean, obviously the election cycle was also one that Christians did not look particularly good at. And then the storming of the Capitol on January 6th was almost entirely done by right-wing Christians and particularly Christian nationalists. So it's not been a good year yeah. from a public relations standpoint. Um, and uh, further than, than on top of that, uh, the evangelical Christian community, which was surprisingly somewhat coherent, even going into this on some basic things, has just really fragmented into um, certainly at least two sides. One has become extremely politicized, uh, buying into Christian nationalism, uh, being very uh, belligerent on, on all things uh, COVID. And then the other side uh, has just tried to maintain a loving our neighbor uh, approach. And, um, and it's just kind of puzzling over how social media feeds have so infected the thinking and conspiracy theories and everything else plaguing the evangelical world here. Timothy Dalrymple, uh, who's CEO of Christianity Today magazine, just came out with a, a, what I thought was a, a fantastic analysis about the splintered soul of evangelicalism in the United States. And I think that was one of the, the better assessments and I would agree with his assessment. Now, local churches, have fared fairly well. This is going to seem ironic, but a lot of local churches, even though Christianity as a whole may have got a black eye in the minds of the unchurched, a lot of local churches did it right. Uh, in my in my estimation, did it right. Uh, they closed, and if they were open, they practiced every safety protocol that was asked of them. Um, they have uh, been trying to put down conspiracy theories and speak truth to that, and they have been... Uh, you know, Christian first and whatever political party they might hold to second. Um, they have worked hard to serve the poor and the homeless and uh, food banks and such in the area. Um, they have uh, uh, spoken out against racism and, and, uh, and worked toward unity there and on and on it, it goes. And so um, that has been kind of like a tale of two worlds. Um, I mentioned us, we, um, and churches as a whole, and, and I don't want to get a drift of where you're want, what you want to talk about, but churches as a whole, in terms of health, there weren't many that just kind of stayed neutral. They either, uh, the vast majority suffered. Uh, they took financial hits. They took numerical hits. I know of very healthy, large churches um, that have suffered a 30% decline in giving online attendance, in-person stuff, everything, laying off massive numbers of staff, uh, canceling all a lot of programs and ministries and international ministry support. But then there's been a group 
albeit much smaller, but interestingly, there's been a group that have just like COVID's like the best thing that's ever happened to them. Their 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 giving is up. Their uh, online presence has just gone through the roof. Uh, when they've had in-person events, they've been slammed. Um, they've had to add staff during this time and even start building programs because of, you know, not being able to handle once it's, it's over, even if it's a slower trickle, what they've gained. Um, we, we're in that group. We actually did. We've actually started a multi-million dollar building program uh for a new auditorium because we're not going to come close to be able to handle what's been happening but we're the we're the minority mm. but i think what separated it is did you already have a bit of a digital footprint going into this were you already kind of a little tech savvy right, were you already right. kind of staffed for that as you know we canceled our whole multi-site strategy to move toward more of a digital strategy and so we were i mean we're looking a lot smarter than we were <laughs> we were just ready to 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 seize this. And also with a staff of, you know, three fourths of our staff are in their twenties and digital natives, it was a very easy move and very natural one. And so uh, all of our marketing was already digital in nature. Um, and so, yeah, for us and other churches like us, we were ready, we were poised, we were comfortable with it. And then by God's grace in the minds of a lot of people, um, we we made the right calls as we went along. Now we actually made a stronger call than some. We have not been open at all. No, 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 all of our weekend services, we have not held a weekend service since March of 2020. Um, we're getting ready to restart those again in June, but nothing since then. And have you and met yet, resistance to that idea of, of... Not from, I mean, not, not from the vast majority. I mean, I can probably count on one hand the emails or letters I've gotten saying, gosh, I wish we'd be open, you know, faith over fear, whatever that kind of stuff is. But we've taught on it and explained it so carefully and have worked so hard at engaging people. And I think there was a high trust level in the leadership and there was a, a wide sense that, hey, you know, when you're a church our size, what, 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 how, what can we do? I mean, if we practice social distancing and we can't have children's ministry and you're all supposed to wear masks and you're not supposed to sing and you're not supposed to, you know, touch each other, um, we still would have the vast majority of our audience online. Yeah. We would be able to serve a very minuscule number of people, but take enormous effort to try to do that. And that would also take away from what we were doing online. We just made the decision to put all of our, all of our apples in that basket and it paid off wonderfully. Yeah. And so a lot of churches kind of felt pressure to open politically or some other reason. Um, I hate that for them. Uh, I didn't have that pressure. But I'm sure I've, we've lost people, I'm sure, over our decisions, but we've gained so many more, it's, it's crazy. But um, yeah. uh, let, let me just uh, jump in there and we'll, yeah, we'll head over to Martin, because I think there's a lot of synergy between some of the, the things that you're articulating, the way that you've gone through the process of COVID, some of the steps you've taken. Um, perhaps it's not been as fraught here in politically, but we've had our own stuff. You know, we, the, the Black Lives Matter rippled throughout. So, has it how much of that is parallel and how much of that is different from yeah. a uk perspective we do, yeah we don't have that um political the, the christian voice isn't anything like as strong here as it has been in the us so that might be a negative thing um so christian voice is in the, is on the back foot uh more post christian maybe but then that has meant that uh we haven't been the church hasn't been criticized for its response in fact, I think generally the church response to the big issues on a national way has been quite positive. The Church of England, like the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, has been really, I, can, I think, respected over the last year. And he did, a big, he did a big service. It was the biggest online church service ever or something like that with millions of people watching. And I think people appreciated that. So we haven't had the negativity I think we've had something like what you said, Jim, on the ground, churches being very kind, engaging with their communities, um, being the ones, because uh, the way that uh, 
society cohesion has happened. There's not a lot of money in local councils. So it's who's going to do the care. And really the church, over the last decade or so or longer, the church has stepped in and is caring for the elderly, caring for doing all the youth work across the whole of the UK. And now doing all the food bank and all that sort of stuff. So it's mainly the church that's doing that. So our church is one of those. So from a local point of view, like you said, Jim, people look at the church and go, wow, they're really kind. <laughs> That's really nice. And we, in our town, we found that local people have joined in with our efforts to, f to help care for the poor. So it's been, and they've been very happy to join in with us and get behind Rosenbrook Church. That's, that's been amazing for local witness. Um, yes, yeah, so, and when it comes to the online thing, Nothing like you uh, at Mech, but we were already online, so it did mean the first Sunday where we realized we couldn't meet, we, were just, we just did the usual thing. It was, everything was set up, so we just carried on, but there was no one in the room. And so it was nothing different for us other than we'd never spoken to a camera without people in the room before, so that was a bit weird. But we were there, and actually, on the whole, we have found... We found people have gone into groups, into small groups, really well. Uh, they're watching on a Sunday, which is lovely, uh, but they're peeling the carrots while they're doing it, and they're feeding the dog, and they're, you know, they're, they're quite distracted, I think, quite a lot on a Sunday. But um, in small groups, meeting online, that's been phenomenal. That's been, we've got better engagement with real church, with one another and Jesus, I think, than we've had, we might have ever have had, actually. It's, uh, and that has not worked for us. Say that's interesting. That's interesting for me to hear because that did not work for us. Right. Our virtual our virtual small groups just flopped. Okay. There was okay. almost no interest in that whatsoever. Wow. I, and I, I don't know why why it was. We we pushed it hard. Um, not everyone is 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 on. There's a load of people who are excluded because they don't have the Wi-Fi. They don't have older people. Um, but on the whole, groups have gone that way. A number of people have opted out because they don't want that. But I'd say on the whole, engagement has increased. Yeah. So that has meant we haven't lost giving. Um, we haven't lost participation. When we've had gatherings, which are, we sometimes do what we call church gatherings, which is the committed coming together midweek to see what's going on, have a better vision. Attendance at those has been really phenomenal actually and that's on zoom that's like one big 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 zoom and that's been really good so i think it's the small group stuff that saved us with see i think with the word that you used that was so critical was engagement that that uh, how how a church it almost doesn't matter how a church does it what matters is did you make the effort to keep your people engaged and i think that's been the dividing line here in the states of churches that have done well and even flourished during this time and those that have not if all you did was just kind of throw something out on the internet and kind of some something on Facebook Live or something and maybe slapped a couple of kids stuff in there every week and didn't really actively seek to find creative ways to keep people engaged, you suffered. So what you did was spot on um, and because you, you worked to keep people engaged that way. We did it a different way, but the, the key is engagement. Mm. And that is such a huge thing over the last 15 months. Yeah. I remember reading that you said, one of the reasons you couldn't go back live was your auditorium was already packed, rammed every time, so you didn't have the space in your auditorium to be able to have people two meters apart. Hence, I can see why you're building a new auditorium. Uh, that makes absolute sense. And, and here, we've had perhaps more people who would really like to come back, haven't we? We've got, we've got a number of people, yeah. half, about half, half. We've done some surveys over the year half, half, half would love to come back, half are saying, no, not until it's completely safe and I can sing my heart out. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for us is pastorally tricky because we really want it. Those people who are desperately lonely and the online thing hasn't worked for them, we'd love to help them. We've done a few evening things, very, very small, little gatherings in person when we were allowed to in the autumn. And we're starting again next week with some of those, but it's the they're coming back. We want to come back safely. We want to come back when the kids come come back. Um, we want to do it according to the law, and we want to do it where we are enjoying it rather than a front-led, priest-led, we're watching the priest at the altar, 
uh, do his stuff, and then we file out, which is perfect for some traditions, and then carry on. But for our tradition, it's more about, so it's all about the coffee, the socializing, yeah, the, the yeah, saying hello to yeah. one another. Yeah. Being family. Well, what we know. did was that we, we have had a series of outdoor in-person events that because we had a fairly large piece of land, we were able to have very large gatherings and events and activities and things that allowed people to see each other and engage and interact in a safe way, following all the protocols that have uh, been put on us. We are gonna be going back to weekly in-person events the first weekend in June, because we told people all along that, um, you know, when we can fully gather and not have the craziness of social distancing, which is just not feasible for us, and we can actually engage in a service and have children, you know, we'll, 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 we'll go back. Well, now here in the States, um, everybody who wants a vaccine can get one. And I'm fully vaccinated. Uh, our whole staff is now completely fully vaccinated. Um, and the, you know, the people who uh, want a vaccine, by and large, have got it or are getting it. So we feel really good about opening back up. Now we'll ticket our services um, because we can't just have a couple of, you know, two or three, four or five services and just let people just show up as they will because we don't know that we can handle the, the capacity. So we'll ticket out our services and continue to have our online presence be as robust as it has been. And that of course will be the way it is from forever. Um, but we'll ticket out our services probably for several months until we can get a new auditorium built. But um, uh, that's our timeline and our situation. Uh, and I know it might be different there in terms of the vaccine rollout, but uh, uh, what I mean, really once, once vaccinated, um, there was very little uh, put on us in terms of restraint. Wow, so it's, it seems a little bit more cautious here in terms of vaccinations, it's still very much the messages we play it safe. We keep basically the the, the restrictions that we've had are still quite um, they've been quite stressed quite a lot, aren't they? Like mm. just because you've got your vaccine, still do all the the normal social distancing. And, and well, yeah, because you can still. We're not sure whether or not you can course, spread it. Yeah. But what we're saying is, hey, if you've been vaccinated, this is you know feel free to come to the service. We're right, essentially. Right pitching the service for all those who have been vaccinated. Yeah. So yeah. we're not worried about spreading it or anything else. Yeah. And then you do have a core of people that are refusing to get a vaccine. And so, I mean, what can you do about that? Sure. If they come, they come at their own risk. So um, we watched a little while ago, one on, on your uh, conference, you talked about, and I don't know whether you coined this phrase, fidgetal, uh, the idea that moving forwards, it's not, normality has been completely flipped on its head like what, what does it mean to be a normal church again post pandemic now that everybody's been exposed to this idea of accessibility online and you've created an online audience you said that you've got a massive growth in that how do you talk us through what digital means for you like what practically if I'm part of your online congregation what does that mean how can I still yeah, have that engagement yeah, yeah the term digital actually began in the marketing world um, it's not original with me um, and but it was this it, a way of discussing the blending of the physical with the digital and hence the word digital. And really what it was after is the seamless integration of the two so that whatever is going on digitally is just a seamless integration with whatever they might need to experience or do experience physically. Um, let me see if I can put it in really simple terms. It used to be for the church that whatever you did online or digitally was meant to serve the physical. I believe going forward, what you're gonna find is the physical is going to exist to serve the digital. It's a, a, real, a real shift mm -hmm. there. And so on a simplest of levels for the typical church, it would mean that uh, however they're used to engaging the world digitally, they'll be able to engage your church. So if they're able to order Starbucks through their phone and pick it up, what do they need to be, what are they going to assume that they would like to do with the church with their phone? Um, is it to pre-register their kids? Is it to have a coffee ready for them? Is it, is it to, um, uh, you know, find out if there's still seats available? Is it, is it to put in a prayer request? Is it to, is it to register for an event? Is it to, 
um, be engaging the message while they're hearing it through their phone or even able to ask questions or even enter a chat room in a service and so many things. So instead of, you know, in the past, you know, please put your phones away and put them on silent mode. Now it's, hey, it's time to take out your phones. We're ready to do a service. And so there's all kinds of, of ways that that can work. There's also issues where um, you, they can receive push notifications even as they're leaving about something that they heard or there's, I mean, this is the most elemental level of this, but there is a sense where uh, everything about the church, it needs to, you know, join the digital revolution in terms of how services are provided, content is, is given, uh, ways of responding, even community, because the very definition of community, the nature of how you would interact with people has changed the digital revolution. There's a lot of people who say, yeah, but the digital revolution can never take away small groups. Well, they didn't take them away from you this year. They, they facilitated them. And that's just the way it often works. It's going to work. That's the way people are with community. I mean, for them, joining a virtual book club or chat room or a, a, a online small group or getting in, uh, uh, you know, uh, FaceTiming someone, that is community. Uh, and that's how they view it. And, um, you know, the church can fight that or it can embrace it as a way of stair-stepping them into even deeper levels of community that the Bible would envision. Yeah, that's good. I think it's, it's helpful to hear somebody like yourself saying so confidently, hey, this is, this is a really good way, a way that we can pursue and we can expect to see you know results similar if not to exceeding that which we were getting before because we, we're embracing a, a new way of being or you know the technology makes stuff available to us it's really exciting and, and, I'll, and I'll add to that I'll add to that yeah um that that churches that feel like um that the answer and what the goal line is to get everybody back in church and have COVID over um man Get that out of your head. Yeah, we'll never return to any a pre-COVID state of the church, and you need to understand. Most people need to understand that they need to continue every bit as much of an online presence after this is over than they as they are now, and that the vast majority of people will still probably choose that as opposed to in person. And um, I would add that the average person now is going to view attending the online campus and attending in, in person as the same. And it's just gonna depend week by week on their schedule, which they do. And we need to be okay with that and not shame people for attending online versus being in person. Yeah, because good. in their mind, I mean, that's just, that's, that's, that's not a scenario that's gonna be effective. Yeah. And uh, you just need to realize that people are gonna be uh, feeling like they've got one of two options. Every church needs to understand that they are now officially multi-site. Yeah. Not in a geographic sense, but in the sense that they have an online campus and they have an in-person campus and they both need to be treated as separate campuses. And you need to think through how you present content, think through everything. We, when, when this is all over, we're already, we're going to be doing separate tapings and filmings and everything for our online campus, even after our in-person services resume, mm -hmm. because it's a different medium. And I'll be delivering the same message, but I'll be presenting it differently. We'll we have the same song, but it'll be presented differently. It'll be presented for the online community because we are, in that sense, uh, multi-site. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, Martin, for people watching this and they're getting excited about this digital thing who have perhaps joined us that aren't in our immediate geographical location or they're wondering, how's it going to look at writing Brook moving forwards <laughs> when we can be in person and are we keeping online? Yeah. I mean. We probably is it going to have the same prominence? What, what what's going to yeah, happen? Yeah, I think I think um, I read what Jimmy just said it then, but I remember reading it. I don't know six weeks ago, two months ago, where you were basically saying it's it's no longer a second class way of in, of joining church to be online. It used to be, well, you're online. That's because you're lazy, or it's because you're not as engaged or you're not as interested. But if you come to the building. Um, you're like a proper church member if you're not online, you're not. To actually what you've just said, and I think it's great, is to view these, you, you are more than welcome to join us online, and we honour you as much as someone who's come here 
and is in the building. That's so important. That's, that is a complete mind change, completely. Because even though we haven't articulated it, we've thought, you know, if you're online, you're not as committed. Uh, whereas if you're here, you really are. Now it's a level playing field. So we've got to keep on going. Now, um, we, again, we've heard, we've seen you, Jim, because we do watch you and we hear what you're saying. It's like, oh gosh, they're going to do an online thing, version which is tailored to the camera and as well as a live one. We have been, we have been talking about this, going, oh man, we haven't got that. It's you, it's you, and it's Dave behind that camera who's, who's doing everything. How are we going to do that? So we are going to carry on doing our online it's going to become the point of unity for our whole church. So it's going to be the online one is the main one. And anything else that happens locally, because we've got a number of different towns that we have some churches in, that's great. But the thing that brings us unity is the online. So if you're, if you're miles away, not in Stafford, and you join online, you are joining at the most central point. Mm. So you're right at the heart of church. Uh, if you come along to one of our locations in a town, that's fantastic, and there's, there's fun there, but online is, is it. So we're going to pump out the Sunday online, even if sometimes there's a Sunday morning where this room is empty, because something, or this room has got, I don't know, a load of five-year-olds in it, or something like that at 10.30. We will have the online pumping out. We're probably going to have to do a hybrid of what Jim was saying, which is, we, you are going, you, you're in charge of this, Dave, aren't you? So mm -hmm. you are going to be sp crafting it, especially for the online people. And, uh, but we are still going to um, film some a service that is in a building with some people in the chairs and whatever. We're going to try and get it right. We're going to adjust the timings from what we're used to. We're used to speaking to the camera now. Somehow we've got to learn an art of speaking to the camera and speaking to the room. We're already experimenting with a little bit of what, I think we might do what Jim is saying once a month, which is create a special that has no audience Yeah. about once a month. I yeah. think that's probably what we're gonna do um, until we have 12,000 people. And, and a media team <laughs> of, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And a beautiful yeah. new auditorium. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, it, and the, the reason that that's so, important and smart what you guys are doing is because that's that's the heart of outreach all all outreach now at, is happening uh, digitally it's all online and you're just not going to have people walk into your door cold uh, they're going to be reached this is the world they live in so that's where you're going to reach them and uh uh so you know that's your front door that that's that's how they that's how they attend your church as a guest uh, and so it's worth all the effort in the world that you can put into it. And um, which is why, you know, it used to be that even I think this is even upended staffing. I mean, to where now what used to be like almost a, a, a boy, that would be nice if I could have that particular role on staff. Now it's like, no, this is essential. Mm. I mean, you're going to do this before children. You're going to do this before maybe arts. You're going to do this before a lot of stuff because it's so absolutely critical. Um, and so, uh, probably the number one types of roles that we've hired in the last 24 months have been roles related to tech, it, all things, videography, filming, editing, producing, storyboarding, producing content for marketing, um, and, uh, all of it digital and online. And, you know, that's, that's the need. That's what you're, you're looking for these days. And some of the most pivotal staff roles you'll have. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I wonder, some of the, the work that you've done that's fascinated me the most is your commentary on, um, on the different generations and how we as, as church need to be considering uh, the, the sort of cultural shifts that happen within those generations to, to, to accommodate for that as the church gets older and, and we, we you know, assimilate those differences into our thinking so that we can allow people to fit into the, the wider church context what you know the, your book you did um, meet generation z and then you're talking about the alphas now what, what 
What's it looking like, the future, and how does, what's the, the overlap in terms of what we've been talking about now in terms of the church becoming more digital, using, capitalising on technology? Does that all play yeah. nicely together? And, and tell us a little bit about some of your work and, and, and research into sure. that, if you would. Yeah, I, I, I think that, that um, well, first, a couple things about the younger generations. If you don't learn about them and understand them and build bridges to them, you're obviously going to be a one and done church generationally because they are the easily the first truly, truly post-Christian by anyone's definition, uh, post-Christian generation. They are in America. Um, they are the largest generational cohort numerically. Um, in just a handful of years, they will not influence culture. They will constitute culture. And so, you know, you, you ignore them at great peril. And so really what we're talking about with Generation Z and Generation Alpha is the next, the, our mission field. This is, this, is, this is who we're trying to reach for Christ. This is the future of our church. Um, so focusing on it for that reason alone is important. They are very different. Um, and it does dovetail with this conversation because they are truly digital natives. They're the first generation that's grown up with constant access to the internet. Uh, through phones and such, and uh, they have differing understandings of community. They have differing understandings of, 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 of sexuality and what they feel about a whole host of issues. Um, and they're um, very ignorant. I don't mean that in a condescending way. I mean, the classic understanding of ignorance, there's just a lack of knowledge and understanding of all things related to the Christian faith, which in some ways can be helpful because they also don't have some of the negative baggage that, say, baby boomers or millennials might have had. Uh, experientially. Um, in terms of, of really understanding all this, if I were to simplify it um, and, and not kind of give a book length answer, um, and in terms of my current research and things, which I gave a taste of at the last Church and Culture Conference, is that what we're really talking about here is the necessity of the emergence of Church 3.0. And what I mean by that is that um, there's only been three iterations, three revolutions, if you will, throughout time. You had, you know, uh, and in relation to communication and mission field. Uh, when the gospel first broke out with the early church, you had church 1.0 emerge, and that was largely oral communication. And it was... Um, a mission field of largely uh, pagans and uh, uh, Judaizing and uh, the Gentiles and such. I mean, you had you had basically a pre-Christian culture. Then you had um, the next major revolution came with all things with the printing press and writing becoming the the written word being the main form of communication, uh, mechan mechanized communication, and. Uh, and that was largely coinciding with it becoming a Christian world uh, with the fall of Rome and the, going forward from there. Uh, really, I would say almost from like 400 to arguably the onset of the Enlightenment era, you could make a very strong case. It's largely a Christian culture um, in terms of form and mechanized writing dominated. Well, we've just gone through or in the midst of a revolution now, only the third one, I would argue, in the West since the birth of the Christian movement. And that is where uh, communication has changed. It's gone from oral to mechanized to now digital. It's only the third, only the third iteration. And we've gone from pre-Christian to Christian to post-Christian. And so you have these two radical shifts in terms of how we communicate and the nature of our mission field that are, you know, we've never experienced this before in history. And the church has never experienced this before. And if the church doesn't realize how radical a shift this is from both mission field and in the nature of communication itself, um, we will lose the day. Yeah, it's a um, scary challenge, but exciting at the same time. Um, and I think it's something that certainly this year for us, I feel has given us an opportunity to take a step back and put everything on the table and say, well, how do we, how do, we do things now? Um, this is a, a real moment to capitalize on uh, readdressing 
Because you know when you're just doing and you just go through the rhythms of, of doing and doing and doing and, and this year's been a bit of a break, so well, how do we do things differently in order to make those gains with this generation that's, that's up and coming? And, and well, here's, here's, what, here's what, you know, here's what's to me uh, so fun about this. Uh, when I say things like that I say, it, it's not this um, kind of uh, kind of a Jeremiah of some types. The, 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 to me, the digital revolution is, is, is amazing because we can reach more people than ever before. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper, it's easier. Uh, people can surface with questions. We've had more honest conversations in online private chat rooms with our services than we ever would have had in person. And people saying oh, over and over again, and we've heard this over and over again, I said, you know what? I would never have a, attended in person. I love this. I, I would have never been, come in person. I would never have talked to a pastor if, if, if for this means. So we're able to do so much for a lot less money. People hear all this digital stuff. Hey, it's cheaper than any other form of marketing we ever could have done, any other form of mass communication we've ever done. So uh, it's it's wonderful stewardship. And also, I would so rather talk to a card-carrying post-Christian than some cultural Christian with all the cultural Christian baggage who I have to spend the first six months of relationship making them see that they're not a Christian. I mean, this is so refreshing where you can just really begin an authentic relationship and an evangelistic one without all that stuff. I mean, they're literally just looking in the eyes. Oh, no, of course I'm not a Christian or no, I don't, I don't believe that at all. I don't, this is what I, and you can start having these very candid conversations that aren't as defensive. Yeah. I think that is, so that, so you said scary and exciting. It's really helpful hearing you say that, Jim, because you said it's exciting about the, um, the digital revolution, but the post-Christian thing, oh no, what does that mean? It, it, it feels quite Jeremiah-like. It feels like, oh no, the sky is falling in. This is really terrible. But you're saying, no, actually this could be a fantastic opportunity because cultural Christianity, it became so cultural that people thought they were Christian or thought they knew who Jesus was, but it's completely wrong and corrupt. And therefore, it's been really hard to evangelize people who thought they were Christian or thought they were in a, in a Christian society. Whereas this could be an exciting opportunity for us. Finally, the purity of the message of Jesus can come like a laser beam mm, yeah. into someone who's never, never thought about it. We've just had a, um, a census, Jim, here. We, we have it every 10 years. It was, it was, there was a lot of debate around it because there's a question in the census, which is, um, yes. what religion are you from? And there's all these categories. Um, one of the, th the humanists got annoyed because it said, what religion are you from? And they don't like the framing because it, 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 it assumes there's a religion you're from. So they were annoyed by this thing. Although they were delighted that everyone is thinking it's going to go below 50% for Christian, the Christian box, which is cult it's obviously cultural because there's not 50% followers of Jesus in the UK. There's a tiny number of followers of Jesus. So that could be a really exciting thing that it's fifth down under 50%, or it could be a depressing thing that there's not as much influence of the Bible and of faith that there used to be. And I feel caught in between the two. Mm. On some level, I think, oh no, there's not the, the beauty of the influence of the Bible and cultural references of the Bible. And oh, brilliant, we no longer have, you know, people who think they're Christian and, and whatever and have got bad understandings of, of what the church is. And this, I've, I've been reading some articles, I must send you them actually, Jim, articles in newspapers about all this, real debate. So the debate about the humanists and then, um, then a, a kind of further debate that maybe actually it might be post-Christendom but it's also post-secularism, that not, not everyone is like Dawkins anymore. In fact, atheism doesn't seem to be on the rise. Um, people are interested in spirituality. Mm. So secularism has gone and that, that creates a whole new thing for us, which is fascinating. And then I read, and then I'm going to read it, but it's from a piece of paper. It's very much 2.0. It's not 3.0, it's 2.0. But that's because I forgot my phone, Jim. But um, it's a beautiful, this is from a, an essay from a guy, professor at Goldsmiths College in London University. I went to Goldsmiths College, so, you know, that's why I want to quote from him. But you'll like this. It's basically reflecting on all these articles in the newspaper. 
Many Christians I meet are also reasonably relaxed about the prospect of living in a marginally post-Christian society, i.e. Jim. A lot of majoritarian status, a loss of majoritarian status is usually good news for large institutions. It allows them, or indeed forces them, to focus on the core message and up their game in terms of innovation, connectivity, and relevance. The current pandemic experience, for example, indicates that in the midst of deep traumas and loss, there is also the desire to forge new relationships and change the direction of one's job or life towards deeper and less materialistic values. The pandemic has not only heightened the significance of religious faith for those who already believe, but has also prompted a renewed and serious interest in those who, before the pandemic, assumed they were comfortable in their non-belief. So this guy is basically saying what you're saying, which is, this is a really interesting moment for those of us who believe evangelistically. Yeah, no, no Christian, just so, I, you know, I, I know that you understand this, but just to be clear, no Christian celebrates the downward metrics. It's just that it is what it is. And so rather than just lament, what, what, what are the positives that could come from this? With, but, you know, obviously I don't celebrate, I'm not excited that we got to this stage. I would like for us not to have gotten to this stage, but I'm excited about what can missionally happen in light of it. Having said that, here's what really the fear I have for the church of the West. Um, when you are realizing that you're truly in a post-Christian context and there's even, even a hostile context toward the faith, uh, or at least you know you don't have cultural support in spreading for your message or standing as a life of a Christian, um, two things can happen. The church can just cocoon up almost to self-protect. We're just gonna, you know, batten down the hatches, you know, uh, pull down the shades and just draw strength from each other as a core <clears throat> over and against this awful culture. Um, that's never worked historically. That's never been a good move historically. Or you can <clears throat> maintain your Christian identity, but work very hard for building cultural bridges and to do everything evangelistically that you can. That has always worked culturally and historically. So the temptation is going to be, oh, that bad culture, or we got to really, you know, hunker down ourselves, as opposed to, oh, wow, this needs to be a missional wake-up call. We can't be turned inward. We can't just, you know do our own thing. We've got to get back to the fact that the church is called to reach this world as opposed to retreat from it. And so I, I think that this hopefully will be a massive wake up call. Um, we had a similar census that was just done in the States, <coughs> excuse me, that found that for the first time, less than 50% of all people were involved in a church, members of a church. And it had been, it was like a, a a drop from the 70 percent just 20 years ago and so this massive like 20 plus percent drop in just uh, a handful of years actually just 10, 10 years just 10 years so um, this was happening all over the place and i just hope it's a wake-up call it certainly um yeah it makes you feel a little bit more the urgency of um the strategies that we need to implement to make sure that we yes. are getting ahead of the curve in mm. terms of how people are but also engaging. knowing what you said that then we're doing that at the moment from the point of view of we've still got a lot of um capital behind us a lot of respect with you know there's still a, a reverence for a certain you know for for church at a certain level what if that gets so eroded in the next 10 years that actually we're we don't have that anymore we that's a very different way of doing evangelism for us in the West, isn't it? It's always been from a place of power and influence. And, uh, but to think that we might do it from a place of no power, or even persecution and opposition, that's like, oh my goodness, how would, I've never thought that, you know, I've never experienced that because I've, I'm here in the West. Yeah. That is for me like, oh gosh, would I, how am I going to do that? If that, if that is what happens. And I, that's why, you know, I'm not, I'm not celebrating the demise of this. I'm thinking, oh no, I just wish it was the 1950s 
or the or the 1820s but, or whatever, but it's not, it's the 2020s. But what's interesting though, I, and this is, this is something I, I remember and I, and I talk to people about this all the time, is that, Jim, you talked about the, the tipping point from people historically moving from a place of that Judaic worldview into a Christian worldview now that we've been told about this Messiah and the fulfillment of the prophecies being a lot easier than the big gap that people then have to cover later on where they have no cultural uh, understanding of, of faith. And, and I always think, oh, what would it have been like to have been one of those first believers who was going to a nation of people who had no concept of maybe even the Judaic mm -hmm. Christian, that, that Judeo worldview, to say, I've got, a, I've got an incredible story to tell you, and I've got a, incredibly good news for you in your life, and it's about this guy called Jesus. And, and what that narrative, how that narrative would play out, um, and it's almost like it, it's, it's really sad that um, I guess people are kind of giving up the facade of, Chris, of being a Christian because it doesn't hold that relevance in the same way. But equally, is the story now becoming fresher? Mm. That, you know, that yeah, and, 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 and I, I, I love how you brought that up because when you study the early church and what was it that had them experience such rapid growth, I mean, obviously, it was the work of the Holy Spirit, but what, what was it that the Holy Spirit was using? What was it that, you know, what he was, what was the, and there were several things, but they're very simple. One, people, the Christians were not just a, losing the facade. They were full 100% unfiltered out there as Jesus followers, just absolutely just completely radical with an open and public with their faith. Um, and uh, second, the community was incredibly loving uh, and accepting of uh, groups of, of in society that had been looked down on, slaves, women, uh, the poor. But um, there wasn't a moral acceptance. It was a relational demographic acceptance. Um, I mean, they still stood for morality. So the equivalent today would not be, well, let me make sure that we just start downplaying sin and accept everybody that way. Not that kind of acceptance, but the community. Like Tertullian said, you know, when he looked at them, he said, look at, look at how they love each other. Like, look at how they love each other was the odd pagan reaction to the Christian church. So you had this very robust faith. You had radical love. Um, and you did have... Um, uh, a, a real sense of, of boldness in proclamation. And I think that, and, and a willingness to explain things. Just let me explain. Let me enter into, you know, the, the areas of culture where conversations are happening and let me, let me throw my conversation in. Church exploded. Just exploded. Yeah, there's um, lots of, Lots of food for thought, isn't there? In, in... Well, you know, your own Michael Green once wrote a book called Evangelism in the Local Church. And, um, uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with him and massive 500 page thing. And I've often joked, I can tell you exactly what that whole book says in one sentence. They shared the gospel like it was gossip over the backyard fence. Which we haven't had to do because we've lived in Christendom. You, I think what's happened is you haven't had to share the gospel, have you? Because you, yeah. And ask yourself an even a more uncomfortable question, Martin. Ask yourself if the people who are post-Christian are noticing that when they encounter a Christian, they're encountering a radically different life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In other words, if, if you interact with me and you're not a Christian, you should, in fairly short order, sense something mm. different about me, mm. uh, a different odor, a different way a different approach to marriage or thinking a sense of the supernatural the some something should stand out and if it doesn't we've got deeper issues yeah, than yeah. what we're talking about yeah yeah and there's a, i think we're, we're we're running out of time really um, draw the conversation to a close it's a great challenge to leave everybody with actually for us in the way that we do right mm -hmm. but also anybody watching this that if you know if you are somebody who professes to follow jesus that 
how, how are we living our lives in this current climate and culture that is speaking something of the gospel to the people? And it's like that classic, you know, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words, right? We, we live our lives in a way that is open, that is loving, that is trying to uh, aspire to be more Christ-like. And, and we just pray that Holy Spirit uses that to catch people's attention and draw them into a kind of uh, relationship with God. So, uh, Martin, any final nuggets, comments, thoughts? Well, I, I guess we're just, because we're, the, the States and the UK are, are similar and also very, very different, but they're, they're, we absolutely can learn from one another, even if there are some differences going on. I, so, we've really appreciated learning from you, Jim, and your church, and, and other churches like you, that as you you go ahead and you think ahead and it, it, it aggravates and provokes us to actually dare to think mm. differently and to, 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 to go further. And so we really appreciate that. We've, and with other churches as well around the world, we, we, there's, there's, uh, we absolutely need to see what, where the Holy Spirit is anointing someone or a church and, and how he's doing it and then kind of learn, you know, learn and be humble and, and take it on board. So even these conversations help that, don't mm, they? Yeah, they're really good, really good. So, um, so thank you, Jim, for joining us. Um, well, it's if an people, honor. people are watching this and they want to catch up with more of the stuff that we're doing, you can subscribe and like and make sure that you, uh, you are on that trail. And then how do people, if they were interested in what you're doing over at MEC, how do they get, get to you guys? Yeah, I would just uh, encourage them to Two websites, the, the, the churchandculture.org site is where they can get free subscriptions to the blogs and access to talks and stuff and, and the resources that are there. So uh, churchandculture.org. And then the church's website, Mecklenburg, is mecklenburg.org. And Mecklenburg is spelled M-E-C-K-L-E-N-B-U-R-G. So, um, and a lot, uh, so, yeah. Perfect. That'd be the way. No, that's great. And, and we would thoroughly recommend people check out uh, some of your material. It's really, really helpful stuff. So uh, thank you again for joining us and uh, we'll, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Cheers.